start hello and good morning everyone um, those of you who have listened to the part 1 of our discussion regarding the west bengal set question paper of 2022 english already know that we have finished up to number 50 right yes. so from today we shall begin with number 51 but before that it was brought to a notice that a particular question i think it's question yes, number 7 sir question 7 of uh, the previous uh, video we uh, that we analyzed in that um, we, uh, question we uh, missed out on the point that the play goa was written by the playwright ashish karim. karim boy yeah, so karim. taking that into consideration actually rather than a which we mentioned as the answer Uh, it's option number C, which is the more fitting one. Okay, so if we go with que- um option number C, so it's A four. That is Asif Karim by Goa. B three. That is Nisim Ezekiel. Do not call it suicide. C two. That is Ramu Ramanathan. Cotton fifty six. Polyester eighty four. And D one. Which leaves us with Abhishek Majumdar, the gems of Edika. Yes. So with that uh, being resolved, let us move on to the next set of questions that we have. That yes. is question number fifty-one and onwards. But before that, we should share our screen with our uh, yes. viewers, right? This one. Yes. Okay. Uh, I hope the screen is visible to the viewers. Yeah, I hope it's visible. Okay. Yes. So, moving on to question number fifty-one. Fifty-one. Yes. In the Tintin comics, Bianca Castafiore repeatedly refers to Captain Haddock as Paddock, Haddock, Padlock, Hopscotch, Drydock, and Hemlock. What are these? An example of the answer here is option number C, spoonisms, which is Spoonerism. quite common. If you are a reader of Tintin comics, you are quite familiar with that entire series of humor, linguistic okay. humor. Okay. So, so we need to know what spoonerism actually is, or how is it defined. So, spoonerism we can define it as a kind of verbal error. in which a speaker accidentally transposes the initial sounds or letters of two or more words often to humorous effect um, as in the sentence that um, you have hissed the mystery lectures instead of you have missed the history lectures right so calling captain haddock as padlock and dry dock we can uh, easily identify this as spoonerisms instead of expletives johnsonese and neologisms expletives you know very well they are just exclamations mm-hmm. of slangs johnsonese you know that and neologisms are the new terms formation Compound. of new compound terms yes. yeah so moving on to question, question number 52. 52 now this is very interesting and the subject matter particularly interests me since i'm into the bengali colonial mm-hmm. uh, issues myself so british commentators during the colonial period sometimes expressed amusement at the kinds of english used by the subject populations babu or babu english of india attracted particular attention because poetic heights in vocabulary and learning despite being full of errors linguists today find a great deal in common between babu english and the ornate style used by many british writers in past centuries which of the following statements can be deducted sorry deduced from the passage option a babu english was unlike modern english b colonial masters appreciated babu english c babu english was used in used by government officials of indian origin d Babu English was perfect English. Well, it's not deep. Babu English was by no means perfect, uh, and it was also not B because colonial masters did not appreciate Babu English. They were simply amused by it. Right. right. So we will go with option A. The answer is option A, A, C, and C. Yeah, A and C. Yes. In this case, something needs to be noticed that well, 
we often tend to confuse the lower uh, letter A with the caps lock A options. So oftentimes yeah. the students go for the A, which is given earlier rather than the capitalized A option, which is the actual option you are aiming for. Yes, students. So if you are looking at th these type of questions where the lowercase A and the uppercase A are both into the question, yes. so you need to be very careful as to which uh, a you're actually aiming for okay since okay. here a and c both the options are correct so you know it's the capitalized a but if only a option uh, i mean the small a was correct it would be very difficult for you to identify that which uh, options you should actually choose and so please be careful with these type of lowercase uppercase puzzles okay moving on to question, question number, number 53 53 yeah, Doctrina. Yeah, this is very interesting. Yes, Doctrina indeed. Christie, the first book to be printed in India was printed in. The answer I'll say is C, sir, right? Yes. It's 1578. Okay, now see, the origin of printing in Malabar was by sheer luck. A printing press was sent from, you know, those things were shipped. Yeah, mm -hmm. actually they were shipped. I mean, sent by ship, not by airplanes, aeroplanes mm -hmm. or trucks or whatever so it was being a printing press was being shipped from portugal to abyssinia the ship carrying the press happened to reach malabar coast where the jesuits captured them yeah they did not return the press they erected it themselves at ambas Khat in kerala in 1556 the first printing press in india now you see this doctrina christian a Latin book by St. Francis Xavier was the first publication from that particular printing press. A Tamil version of Doctrina Christum by name Thampuran Varakkam was published in 1578. So this is the book we are talking about. Right. It's not exactly Doctrina Christum. It was a translation of the Doctrina Christum. Yes. So moving on to question number 54. Who satirically described English as India's auntie tongue, as opposed to its many mother tongues? You might be knowing the name of the book, The Otherness of English, by this guy, Probal Daj Yes. Yeah, yeah, he is, he is very famous. The Otherness of English, uh, the subtitle runs like this, India's auntie tongue syndrome, right? So The Otherness of English, India's auntie tongue syndrome is written by Probal Daj Gupta. And uh, this is just not just a satirical depiction. Many of the critics after him had, uh, or the linguist had pointed out that India, uh, India's auntie tongue, English, had really been uh, influential in shaping the socio-cultural backgrounds of, uh, the, and also mindsets of people those days. So. This satirical description also entailed a kind of uh, acknowledgement uh, about um, how English influenced or reshaped India's destiny. Okay, so that makes this make this option option A. a yeah, Probal Dash. Okay, moving on to question number fifty-five. There is no village in India, however mean, that has not a rich Thala Purana legendary history. What is the technical term for using Bhasha words in an English text? Well, uh, that might be code switching, right? Yes, option D. Option D, code switching. See, what is code switching? I think uh, I must uh, yes, we need to define it here. This a bit. See, when you're going for code switching, in linguistics, code switching or language alteration occurs when a speaker alternates between two or more language. Ye dil mange more. Okay, ye dil mange is Hindi and more is English. So the rich sthala purana or legendary history. So one particular word is being brought out from another language. How do you define it, sir? It's yes, a uh, code switching. That's the answer. Okay, we go with option number D. Now, moving on to question 56. Who was the proponent of a major campaign against Indian writing in English under the rubric of what came to be called nativism? The answer is A. Balacharan 
Nimade. No, it's Balchandra. Balchandra. Okay. Balchandra Nimade. Nimade. Yeah, I don't know much about him. Yeah, neither do I. But we'll, that's a movement that will make many of us go out of our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, I think Balachandra Nimade must be studied in greater detail uh, oh, for perfect. us to know about this uh, major campaign against Indian writing in English. Of okay, so I would suggest all of you to go through this. And if you want us to talk more about this, please let us know in the comment section so that we might study about him and let you know about his works. Going on to question number 57, the next page. Who is the author of the Indianization of English? Well, you know, it's Braj Kachru, right? Yes. Okay, number 58. These are, you know, facts based questions number 57 and the others but when we think of the assertion reasoning questions and yes. matching questions are also fact based yes. isn't it yes for but, the most part yes yeah for the most part it is fact yes. based we haven't seen any other kind of that so far so but this fact. one this this is an exception mm -hmm. number 58 according to Baudrillard, the success of advertisements depends on their ability to conjure up a seductive hyper reality which of the options below is not a feature of hyper reality now see uh, all of you i'm i'm sure have studied simulations mm -hmm. by Jean, Jean Baudrillard, right? right so uh Option A, it is a reflection of basic reality. Option B, it masks and perverts a basic reality. Option C, it masks the absence of a basic reality. And option D, it bears no relation to any reality. What do you think the answer will be, sir? The answer is B, it masks and perverts the basic reality. Because the basic supposition of modular simulations is that there is no reality. The very idea that there is an original reality which is substituted by substituted, simulations yes. is actually faulty because simulations makes you want to be assured of the fact that there is a reality when actually there is none. There are only simulations. So the idea that there is a basic reality which has been perverted does not uh, matter here. It's yeah, not it's quite... masking and perverting a yes. basic reality, which is not the feature of hyper reality. Yes. Rather, option C is more accurate when it says the absence of basic reality is being uh, masked by the simulation. Sometimes what the students do is they go on for the right option instead of noticing the not that is not, not. that is written exactly. in the question. So exactly. be very careful when you're reading the question. If a not, I think it's given in capital letters mm -hmm. here, is given, you need to be very careful about which option you're choosing. Absolutely. Moving on to question number 59, sir. A reading of a literary work that is determined by its effect or emotional impact on the reader has been termed as, you know that, it's affective, affective fallacy. fallacy. Okay, now aporia, intentional fallacy and dissociation of sensibility, if we want to discuss them, it will take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. If you want us to discuss them in great detail, you need to comment and let us know and we will do that for you. Yes. Okay. Question number 60. Under which of the following disciplines would study of emojis and emote icons be placed? Now, see, I'm not very sure about this. Mm, but yes, we yeah. have discussed this question in great detail. And uh, since we are not from linguistics background ourselves, mm -hmm. even though we had had to study this at some point i mean linguistics at some point we are not very sure about the answer given here all the answers except uh, semantics seems very likely indeed indeed uh, and semiotics we will go with option c semiotics but mm -hmm. we need to uh, wait for the commission's decision on this okay what wbcsc has to say regarding this we need to uh, watch and understand from there what they're trying to mean. Exactly. You know, I think if the boards and the universities or the commissions who are conducting such types of exams mm -hmm. would provide a detailed explanation of the answer keys, yes. that would be, I think, far better than that just the answer keys provided. Yes. Because see, all the three, 
options A, B, C are so very close and so very likely and so very close to the relations of emojis and emoticons. Mm -hmm. So I'm not very sure about which options to choose. See, actually, all three options are about different approaches of studying. Exactly. It can be about the same object with yeah. different approach. So all three approaches can be applied, I believe, for emojis and emoticons. emoticons yes. So which one is more accurately uh, the uh, method for studying emoticons? That's different matter. Yeah, only the question setter knows that what he or she had in mind yes. when this question was framed. So we will go with option C for now and wait and see what other options uh, are being provided to us in yes. the actual answer key. Okay. So let's but, move on to question, question number, number 61. One. Which of the following is not a science fiction film? This is also a very controversial question. Yes. We will uh, go with sir, option D, right? Vertigo, which is a film by Alfred Hitchcock. It's a psychological thriller rather than a scientific science fiction novel. Option A, B, and E would be very familiar to you as B both films. And C. B and C, yes. Avatar and as, E.T. You know Avatar. Yeah. Everybody knows and Avatar. E.T. Both are films actually by Steven Spielberg, right? Yeah. And, and A is a novel fiction. rather yeah. than a uh, film. It's a science fiction novel. Yes, and no, by... there's a there's a horror novel known as sorry horror yes. film named ne Necromancer. Necromancer. No, see, but if... that's not a uh, science fiction. The yeah. novel is science fiction. This is what I'm trying to say that this question, uh, when they're explicitly mentioning the word film, mm -hmm. so option A and D both could be correct. Yes. But we know that option A has a book, which is a science fiction. Uh, by its own right. Yes. So we are ruling out option A and going with option D. But if you stick to the word film, then both option A and D are correct. So Gordon Dixon's novel, Necromancer, is one of the most important uh, science fiction novels. But yes. it's not a film by any means. Yeah, it's not a film. And till date, we haven't received any news of it becoming a film, right? Yeah. Right. But it could be in the near future. So moving on to question number 62, who is the first Bengali actor to perform a Shakespearean character in a colonial theater in Kolkata? That's a very interesting question. Yeah, uh, we as Bengalis should know the answer. It's option B, version of Charan Adhya. Often, right. yeah, we, we might confuse it with Girish Ghosh, but mm -hmm. it's not the right answer. It's B. Mm -hmm. Sir, could you could you throw a little bit of light? About... Yeah, Girish Ghosh, as we know, is one of the first persons to adapt Shakespeare into Bengalism. So, and he perhaps acted as well. But when it comes to the first actor, it's B. So moving on, we can discuss this in further detail in some other time, if especially uh, the viewers think it would be interesting. We are more than happy to. But for now, let's move on to the next answer. Do we have anything more to say upon this? No, no, no. Okay. Let's move on to the next question, which is again, match the following. Yes. The Last Supper, Balzac, the Ambassador's Bach, Sarasine, it's Cantata. Leonardo da Vinci and Hans Holbein. Now, the answer is pretty evident. We know that Vinci's Last Supper, yes. Balzac Saracen, and the rest of the question falls into place. And we go with option A. Yes. That is Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci, Balzac Bal Saracen, and uh, The Ambassadors by Hans Holbein. And Bach would be Bach would be counted. We know that. Now, next question is question number 64. In an essay of dramatic poesy, the play Dryden chooses to justify the difference of English drama is silent woman, right? The silent woman. Option A. Yes. Keep your scene or silent woman. It's a play by Ben Johnson. Moving on. To option question number 65. The 1966 film Dil Dia Dard Dia is an adaptation of. Now, this is a very, very interesting question. I know it is an adaptation of Wuthering Heights, but only after an extensive search in the Google. 
so mm. most of us even though we are a huge fan of bollywood and a huge fan of wuthering heights we do not know the answer of this mm. question so if it is jumped upon us in a stressful situation like the set exam mm-hmm. hall we will be definitely bowled over by this question so i would suggest all of our viewers to please go through the wikipedia articles on these uh, famous english novels mm-hmm. the classics especially and their bollywood adaptations i mm-hmm. think because hollywood adaptations are pretty well known mm-hmm. and everyone watches them and every diligent student of english literature tends to be aware of these hollywood mm-hmm. adaptations and all kinds of english adaptations are also within the purview of our students or our a competitive exam aspirants viewing yes. but bollywood we tend to you know ignore it when yes. we uh, when it comes to the classic literature classic mm-hmm. brit lit uh, and so this wuthering heights is an example dil diya dard diya is really uh, i am uh, not such a well known not a familiar name at all yeah not a familiar name at all unless you are a really huge bollywood movie buff <laughs> Okay, moving on to question number sixty-six. Raymond Williams' theory of cultural materialism was influenced by. No, this is the answer. The most fact. evident one will be Karl Marx. Option B. Uh, however, cultural one materialism. may say that all four figures feature within Raymond Williams' thought. We can analyze the relations between them, but uh, the most basic tenet of cultural materialism is taken from Karl Marx's. dialectical materialism and the word presence of the word materialism itself will, will indicate the fact that marx is most important here so option b marx okay moving on to question number 67 who among the following described science fiction as a gamut of speculation and social criticism hardware and exotic adventure well this one also i had to google sir mm-hmm. i think it's option a option a robert scolis and robert eric rapkin and eric rapkin yes we go with option a robert scolis and eric rapkin now next one is very close to my heart and i like it very much the concept of the rhizomatic narrative was formulated by its option c guys deluge and felix guater yes please read on this rhizomatic narrative because it is very interesting i would urge all my viewers to read upon it because if you are going into research this is really going to help you and deluge tends to appear quite often in comparative yes years. yes deluge and guattari both appear in net and set and other kind of yes. gate and other comparative gate, gate yeah yes we need to remind uh, remember about gate as well yes. because students now tend to appear in gate first before appearing in net and yes. set because the graduate students are eligible for gate, gate right yes so let us move on to question number 69 69 Which of the following personalities was the founder of the Society of Quakers and a leader of the Quaker movement in England? It's option A, George Fox. George Fox. Yes, option A. We go with option A. Seventy. I. A. Richards' practical criticism inaugurated a new phase in English in the history of English critical thought. What is the book subtitle? Now, this one also I found a little bit difficult to answer because. all the four all the three options a b and c are practically so very mm-hmm. close to each Indeed. other okay but we go with option c sir option c a option study c. of literary judgment yes so question number 71 in a defense of poetry p b shelley differentiates between reason and imagination in all the following ways except one identify the exception now this is also very interesting reason respects the differences and imagination the similitude of things now i think this is not the exception mm. option b reason is to imagination as the body to spirit it's an analogy and it is a correct analogy option c reason is the enumeration of quantities imagination is the perception of value of these those quantities hmm. yes 
yeah he actually this is actually a quotation that's a quotation yes yes and option d reason and imagination are related to each other as charcoal to fire i don't think that appears that anywhere is not so this is the exception yes. and yes this is not the part of the text and we go with option d in case of uh, shelley's defense of poetry yes Moving on. So I believe this is yet another example that you cannot answer the question unless you are familiar with the text itself. Yes, yes, yes. This is not only factual, but you need to be very familiar with the text in order to answer such intimate yes. questions. And this is one of the texts that you have to read for such competitive exams. Dryden, you know, when we are mm -hmm. coming to the defense of poetry type things, we need to read Sydney first, Sydney, then Dryden, and Dryden, then Shelley. Shelley. And later on, maybe Eliot. Yeah. Um, yeah. But these three... Yeah, they are the defenses. Yes. These defenses need to be very strong in order to <laughs> <laughs> defend yourself from the question setters. Moving on to question number 72. Plato's allegory of the cave occurs in, you know, it's the Republic. The Everyone Republic. knows this. I told you that don't think all the questions will be very difficult. <laughs> this, this question number 72 is an example of how the question setters think of everyone when they're setting the question, right? Everyone knows the answer. Okay, moving on to... 73. Longinus in his discussion on the first two sources of the sublime says that these two conditions of sublimity depend mainly on natural endowments. The phrase natural endowments refers to passion and grandeur of thought, creative artifice, prophetic quality, and aesthetic excellence. Now, the answer to this would be, I, I think... I believe it's A, right? Passion and grandeur passion of Passion and thoughts. grandeur of thought. Yes, now, I would like to comment here mm -hmm. that this the sublime by longinus has been a very favorite of these questions setters since 2016 exactly. yes exactly. before that longinus would be not mm -hmm. so common not so familiar but horus and longinus has become a re uh, recent favorite to these question setters so i would urge all my viewers to please go into because all of us go through plato and aristotle mm -hmm. but longinus and horus tends to be a little bit um, ignored yes. when we uh, come to studying for set and net so please study horus and longinus in order to answer the questions regarding them solidly Yes. Uh, so we will go with option A for question number 73. And for question number 74, we have Aristotle again. Yes. In his definition of tragedy, Aristotle uses the phrase pleasurable accessories, which means grandeur of spectacle, rhythm and harmony of song, use of dramatic episodes, and use of delightful statements. Well, I think it will be option B. Rhyme and harmony of Pleasurable song. accessories. When of they're song. talking about accessories, see, spectacle is not an accessory. It is mm -hmm. a primary, it is of primary importance. Yes. Use of dramatic episode is also very primary. Yeah. And use of delightful statements, that is diction. I think that goes with diction, right? Yes. So which which is also not an accessory. And rhythm and harmony of or song. Or song is more important because song is really an ex accessory. And even though music is important uh, regarding the dramatic performance, mm -hmm. but uh, the song was sort of an optional thing. Yes. Especially in case of tragedies. The chorus was getting more and more obsolete with time as the play uh, developed. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We know that from Aristotle. So it's more of an accessory in later days. And and chorus used to more uh, like comment on the yes. issues rather than sing or uh, promote any kind of musical yes. performance in they case of tragedy. Uh, forward the action in the play in any form. Yes, they, they would just comment upon what is happening and mm -hmm. discuss them regarding uh, what is happening et and etc. in front of the audience. Yes. So the song was getting the status of an accessory and nothing more mm -hmm. when Aristotle was writing this. Yes. Moving mm -hmm. on to question number 75. This is also very important and I am not sure about this if, even though I have studied poetics in quite a thorough detail. Mm -hmm. While discussing comedy in his poetics, Aristotle refers to the ridiculous, which he defines as option A, mistake or deformity, not productive of pain. Option B, comicality of thought and design. 
see admixture of satire and parody d element of fun exciting laughter so what would you say the answer and is option i believe would be most fitting is a mistake or deformity not productive of pain however as ma'am mentioned comedy is something that is very uh, sparsely uh, mentioned in poetic as such yes, so and the I options think... tend to mix up together yeah. but a would be more precise to the text itself option d is out of the question it's element yeah. of fun exciting laughter no but admixture of satire and parody and comicality of thought and design is just as likely i think yes they are almost synonymous as options but it's option a that we go with to... option a for now and let us wait for the commission to decide on the yes. correct option later yes. moving on to question 76 this is also something that i am not very sure of yeah. who charged conrad with excessive use of imprecise adjective and what the options are ian what ian what chinua achibi edward side and f r levis now the thing is that chinua achibi has uh, charged him with the imprecise use of adjectives but he also cites f r levis as being the first one who says the same thing so it's actually f r levis if we follow chinu archive's own account of the thing but it can be both b and d um, by that uh, by that process but so, it's firstly d so we go with f r levis yes option d for question number 76 moving on to question number 77 the original title of oh horace is here again the original title of horace is as poetic is peri Omaton, Epistula, and Pisonus, De Poetica, Rhetorica, and Herennium. Well, my Latin sucks, and <laughs> I think the option B, Epistula, yes. and Pisonus, would be the correct answer. Yes, Epistles. Epistles. It yes. was written in the form of epistles, I guess. Letters. Yeah. Yeah. So, is option B. Moving on to another, another match. match. Yeah. yeah, Raymond Williams co-text Clifford Geats episteme head and white thing thick description and Michel Foucault structure of feeling. Uh, I think we will go with option number D here. But again, I'm telling you, I'm not very sure about this. What about yes, you, sir? This is a rather difficult one because we know Raymond Williams's structure of feeling. Uh, absolutely sure about that. But then Clifford Geats. uh episteme i don't i'm not sure about that michel focus could be actually epistemes but the option also says cortex yes so, but i haven't found any proof over the internet that mm-hmm. foucault discusses cortex yes. or mentions even cortex whereas episteme is quite close to his own thoughts archaeology of knowledge is something you might consult here uh, episteme basically meaning knowledge sets of knowledge So no, option, we are going, uh, with, going with option D. Option D. But all all of you are requested to recheck this, and if you find any other answer, please let us know in the comment section. You can join the group that uh, the link of which is provided mm-hmm. in the description box. Please join the group, discuss with us, comment, and connect with us so that we might bring up forward better contents for you in future. Moving on to question number seventy nine. Who is the author of the book The School of Abuse? Now you know that it's Stephen Gossen. Why do you know that? Why is he famous? Not because of himself, of course. Yes. He is famous because Sydney had uh, written defence. Yeah, Sydney. He is famous because of Sydney. Simply, that's the answer. Option D, Stephen Gossen. And the things Gossen. Dedicated his book to Sydney, which is why in the first place came to yeah, his attention. Yeah, yeah, Sydney. Yeah, it came to Sydney's attention because he dedicates the book to him, and I think he sends a copy to him as mm. well. And it was, of course, very Not, offensive. Yeah, it was very offensive to Sydney's sensibilities, and he writes a very scathing answer to this, yes. which constitutes uh, most of our. syllabus yes. criticism syllabus right mm. okay that's the first text that we go through going moving on to question number 80, 80. now this is the favorite kind of question that i was thinking about assertion and reason marked as a assertion is marked as a and reason is marked as r assertion western post feminism 
rejects the 20th century feminist movement as being entirely without value. Reason. Western post-feminism finds the contemporary Western women to be independent and empowered consumers. Now, option A says both A and R are correct, and R is the correct explanation of A. Option B says that both A and R are incorrect, and R is not the correct explanation for A. C says A is correct, but R is incorrect. D says A is incorrect, but R is correct. Now, we shall go with option B. Both A and R are incorrect, and R is not the correct explanation for A, because Western post-feminism does not entirely reject the 20th century feminist movements as being entirely without value. No, A is by no means correct. Now, if we understand that much, we go with option B and D. Okay, but R is not correct as well. If we read R very carefully, the reason Western post-feminism finds that contemporary Western women to be independent and empowered consumers. I don't think that is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, consumerism, when we're talking about post-feminism and consumerism, the two does not mix at all in case of these contemporary Western women. So we go with option B, I think. Both A, what do you think? Both yes. A and R are incorrect and R is not the correct explanation. For yes, me. I believe so. Okay, moving on to question number 81. Identify the odd one out from the following. A prominent feature of modernism is the phenomenon called avant-garde. A prominent aim of modernism is to challenge the norms of the dominant bourgeois, bourgeois culture. Uh, C, modernism in literature and the arts had parallels with the movement known as positivism. D, modernism involves a radical break with some of the traditional bases, not only of Western art, but of Western culture in general. I think we will go with option, option C. C, yes. But once again, I have to mention the fact that when you are qualifying modernism, and it's such a diverse movement uh, where you cannot really pinpoint what each modernist is saying and group them together. So many modernists for that matter will say that they're aiming for a alternate uh, positivism. For example, when you speak about Eliot, he speaks about that entire copper world metaphor, right? And that's an example of scientific positivism that he's aiming for. But no, and the question is also very confusing. Identify the odd one out of the following. What's odd? What's yes. the definition of odd? It's here? not about even exception, like which one is not applicable. All four of them are applicable. applicable yes. See, that is less likely in the sense that not many modernists are aiming for some form of a recreation of positivism, but it's nonetheless there in, for example, elite and others. Okay. Now we move on to question number 82. Which literary critic wrote the language of poetry is the language of paradox? We know it's again a factual question. It's yes. Clem Brooks. You have studied him very finely in your criticism papers. Moving on to question 83. Who said there is no cultural document that is not at the same time a record of barbarism? It's option A, Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin, it is. 84, what is EBSCO host? Well, it is a text database and when you, okay, now some of us are very confused about this. So I'm going to talk about EBSCO host a little bit before mm -hmm. we move on to the next uh, question. EBSCOhost is an intuitive online research platform. Now you might ask that ma'am, how is this a text database? Since it is a research platform, it is used by thousands of institutions and millions of users worldwide. With And these contains quality databases and search features. So all the researchers can search for their relevant materials in EBSCOhost. Mm -hmm. So we go with Option B, a text database. It is also a search engine, but it is not entirely a search engine. Right. Okay, it is not a citation protocol mm -hmm. at all. It is not an anti-plagiarism software. Option B and C might be confusing because uh, some might say it is a search engine, but a search engine uh, typically connects to the other websites, mm -hmm. but EBSCOhost is a um, 
research okay. platform as uh, yeah in itself and the search engine provided within it uh, only connects to the um, materials or the database provided within the EBSCO host. Okay, exactly. so we go with option B, a text database. Now, question number eighty-five is once again fact-based. Match the following. Yeah, another match the following. Now, see, this is really very strange for me. I myself have never seen a question paper that is so very peppered with match the following. Indeed, this is the first time in my life, in fact, I have <laughs> seen such a question paper. But it is very interesting because the students are getting to uh, be more familiar with this kind of questions yes. both ANR assertion and reasoning questions yes when the net exam was conducted many of the students um, complained about the assertion and reasoning mm -hmm. questions seems like the question setters and set heard them and heard their prayers and reduced the assertion and reasoning questions yes. and provided a lot of matching also chronology questions yeah, I know. yeah. Uh, complained about and we don't see any chronology questions <laughs> any chronology questions in here and when i used to uh, appear for these exams these chronology questions used to irritate me a they lot. are really intimidating <laughs> <laughs> okay moving on to question 85 elan showalter jack derrida edward Sy, jola bart sz representation of the intellectual gift of death and the literature of their own this is very easy students i won't go into the details elan showalter literature of their own derrida the gift, of, gift death. of death, Barth, SZ, and Edward side representations of the intellectual. Yeah, so we go with option A. A. Right. Moving so, on. So you're not very visible. Okay. Uh, question number 86. Literature is a body of text, usually but not always recorded in writing, using commonly recognized symbols. While readers do seek newness in stories, they tend to react badly to too much of it. There is therefore both a conservative and an inventive element in good writing, and the best authors find the right balance between them. Which of the following conclusion does not follow from the above statement? Option A, literature is always made up of books. Literature is a social pursuit. Literature requires the use of shared codes. And D, good literature is made up of traditional elements along with individual talent. Now see, option D, we should rule out in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Because tradition and individual talent is mentioned in the um, quote, right? Yes. Literature is also social pursuit because um, readers are termed as a collective body yes. and therefore the social pursuit option is also ruled out. See, literature requires the use of shared codes. Yes, of course, that can also be ruled out because it follows from the above statement. So we are left with option A, literature is always made up of books. Mm. There is nowhere mentioned that uh, literature is yeah. always made up of books. Rather, the first sentence mentions usually but not always recorded in writing. So it can be not recorded. It can be simply oral literature, right? Yes, it could so be anything. It is not necessarily made up of books. Okay, so we go with option A, option A. question number 86. Moving on to question 87. Who employed the term analepsis to denote a flashback or the account of an event prior to the narrative in question? Sir, this is your fault. This is Ja Janet. Yeah, it's Ja Janet. It's a question from narratology. Moving on to question number 88. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Which, with which critical theory would you associate the above statement? Structuralism, postmodernism, reader response theory, and Marxist literary theory. I think it's obvious. It's an obvious one because it comes straight from Karl Marx himself. So it is option D, Marxist literary theory. Yes. 89, who is not a member of the Frankfurt School? Another very easy question. Adorno, Habermas, Marcus, and Frederick Jameson. Yeah, so the option D is the right option because Jameson is a Marxist, but he's not. From the Frankfurt, Frankfurt School. School. Yeah, he's not. Yeah. Which of the following, question number 90, which of the following books is written by Jürgen Habermas? The Philosophical Discourse of Modernity, The Unfinished Product of Modernity, The Conservative Movement in Modernity, and The Exclusion of the Other in Modernity, sir. Yeah. So these are all mm, titles that are close with one another, but uh, 
we know that is philosophical discourse of modern. That's the title of the book. So it's option A. Another fact-based question. Now, this is also very important. Which of these theories use the duck rabbit puzzle as the key explicatory motive? Queer theory, reader response theory, third wave feminism, and Jungian psychoanalysis. I would politely decline to answering this. So yes, what do you say? This is a question that is indeed rather confusing because this option, uh, this uh, example of the duck rabbit puzzle, if you may see a picture of it, please Google it out and yeah, see. Yeah, please Google it uh, out. The duck, a figure is given and yes. either you see the duck or you see the rabbit or you see both, but which yeah. one you see first is important. Yeah, that's something of a image that is circulated often in WhatsApp messages. If yeah. I if I appeared for said this year, I would go with the reader response theory. Yes, because it's about reader's perception. So that's important. And yet, one can study this from multiple angles, especially yes. Jungian psychoanalysis would be very important uh, in understanding this figure. And also, I would Queer theory. Uh, mention that uh, all these theories, they use the one another. Queer theories use the Exactly. All these and... are so very in, uh, yeah, interconnected yeah. that you cannot, uh, you know, just pack them into watertight yes. comfort. It's not, not like third wave excludes Jungian. So, uh, I believe the answer, uh, as ma'am also agrees, would be reader response, but one cannot be sure about it. We will wait for the WBCSC's answer key in order to be 100% sure about it. Yes. Moving on to question number 92. Language bears within itself the necessity of its own critic, and we know the answer, it's Jacques Derrida. Yes, option, option A. a. Hmm. It's Jacques Derrida. 93, Shodh Ganga is, all of you know this, it is a reservoir of research thesis in India. If you're still not aware of what Shodh Ganga is, it's high time you Google it, go through it, and conduct your own research with the help of Shodh Ganga. Yes. It will go a long way in finishing your research very quickly. Mm -hmm. Shodh Ganga really gives an idea of what kind of research and the volume of research that is happening that is in happening. India. And, and it's very interesting. When I open Shodh Ganga, I, I get lost into the depths of it and the wonderful theses that are uploaded in it. They simply mesmerize me. All of you are requested to go through Shodh Ganga in your free time. Just make it your hobby to go through Shodh Ganga <laughs> whenever possible if you're a researcher and even if you're not a researcher. Okay, PMLA stands for? It's a basic... Uh, publications of the modern language association yes. i think option b option b okay going on to question 95 you know they are giving the easy questions at the end Towards of the, the question of, paper yeah. so those of you uh, got this set uh, set x i think this is set x x3 x3 yes. okay what whatever this x set is really it would benefit you if you started the question paper from the bottom instead of the top See, we are moving on very quickly through this. Which of the following is true about field experiment in ELT research? Okay, what is ELT? It's English language teaching, right? So, A, high internal validity, B, high external validity, C, high internal and external validity, and D, high metaphysical validity. Now, we will go, when we are talking about field experiment, mm -hmm. we will go with question, uh, sorry, option number C. C. Yeah, High, because both internal and external validities are important. Are important in case of English language teaching and field experiments that are related to this ELT research. Yes. Moving on to question number 96. The index of a book is a part of metatext, subtext, text, and paratext. Now, see, I will uh, just touch upon the options a little bit. Mm -hmm. It is not a text because it is an annex yes. so it is not a text it is not a subtext because subtext is not written down anywhere in the text yes. we need to understand by our by applying our own experiences yes. to the text no meta text no and so we go with paratext exactly d is the answer 97 which of these citation protocols used in the format author date title of publication b and d i think chicago Yes. Chicago and Chicago and APA. APA, yes. Author date title, yes. 
the other but, forms but they APA, APA, where is the date in APA? Yeah, APA is first, first surname, then first name, just uh, After the, that, the date. main abbreviation, and then within brackets the date. So, and that's also the format for Chicago. Chicago. Yes. So B and D will be the answer. I mean, no, not B and D. Option C will be the answer within which B and D is enclosed. Exactly. Option. That is something one needs to be careful about. Yes, please be careful about this. Option C is the answer. For the other formats, is basically the surname, first name, and then title. Yes, and, and the date comes at the end. Later. MLA yes. and other things. Yes. Now, I'm not going to read this passage because mm -hmm. it is from the test of the dear Burvis, and all of you have read the text and you know about this even better than me. So I'll just move on to question number 98. Um, which says the atmosphere being in such delicate equilibrium and so transmissive implies that we will go with option A, the time was twilight between day and night, the atmosphere charged with effusion of feeling. Okay. Now, I hope you don't mind. Sir. Yes, that's the correct option. However, I have to mention the fact that this is a question. So, like, it's more of a subjective question. It depends upon the reader's interpretation. So how no, does see, the see, reader see. The air was emitting soft sounds? No. no. It was evening and the air was transmitting perfumes of flowers? No. That's not me. So B like might be likely. Yes, the atmosphere was gently true. divided into two parts transmitting spirituality. But see, the two parts is not described as, uh, or not exactly it's mentioned. There, but later on it's there. We cannot directly relate it. So it depends upon how you interpret the passage, actually. Okay, so A and B might be the likelier options, and we are here going with uh, option mm -hmm. A because see the time was twilight between day and night. Mm -hmm. So this might be the divisions that the author is talking about. Yes, the passage mentions evening, so twilight. Yeah. Okay, moving on to question ninety-nine. There was no distinction between the near and the far, and an auditor felt close to everything within the horizon. So, through which, through whose point of view are these words presented? Now, this is very easy. It is not Angel's point of view, not Tess's point of view, not the reader's point of view. Mm -hmm. Since this is Hardy we are talking about, yes. it is obviously the author's point of view. Option A might be the correct option. Yes. Even though some might argue that it is Tess's point of view. Uh, one may say that Tess's own emotions are getting reflected in the third person point of view. But I don't think that's so. A it is Hardy we are talking about. Yes. Since it's Hardy, I think you can safely go with the author's point of view. With Jane Austen and Hardy, you can never go wrong with such things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if it was... Um, these Bronte sisters we are talking yeah, about. Or even Dickens. For or even point. Dickens, yes. We and use... especially modernist writers like no, Joyce. Let's, that would be let's very not difficult. go into the modernist yeah. writers. But when we're talking about the Victorian and, well, Hardy, you can obviously say that Hardy is a modern writer. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you're from a traditional university like me, <laughs> that's Calcutta University, we term Hardy as a Victorian, Victorian. <laughs> instead of modern okay mm -hmm. so well that's debatable and i won't go into debates today mm -hmm. so i will since it's hardy we are talking about we will not go into any kind of compartmentalization since it's hardy it's the author yes yeah he's like fate itself yeah yeah we can write a paper on that <laughs> how hardy is fate impersonated mm -hmm. in case of his texts mm -hmm. he, he's the very embodiment of the fate right mm. right the he's not person, just writer. he's not just fatalistic he is fate in those books yeah we can think about that yeah we can think about that and uh, the viewers are also requested to let us know what you think of hardy and we move on to the last question of today to speak absolutely both instrument and execution were poor but the relative is on through whose voices are these words presented through the voice of Tess, through the voice of the author, through the voice of Angel, through the voice of both author and Tess. Now, sir, I think thinks it's B, through the voice of the author. Yes, once again, I think that's the answer. Yeah, but I would like to go with a different answer, sir. <laughs> yeah, I would beg to differ. I think it's through the voice of both the author and Tess. Yes, uh, because it 
once again depends upon your interpretation. You might say that Tess's emotions are getting reflected into the author's own voices. Right? That often happens. Yeah, but through, through the author's voice, it is presented. Exactly. I'll go on with Sir's answer. Because the question here says, through whose voice are these words yeah, presented? Voice. So it's the author's voice, not Tess's voice. Yeah, voice might be the important word here. Voice might be the keyword. And so we go on with option D, not op sorry, option B through the voice of the author and not option D through the voice of both author and Tess because mm -hmm. Tess is not speaking this. Mm. However, I must say the person who has made the question has read uh, Hardy quite yes. carefully. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, he has, he or she has yes. gone through the text very thoroughly in order to present such a subtle question. Mm -hmm. I, I really need to say that this question paper, um, I think we can stop sharing the yes, screen. We can. So I think that uh, the question was very well made and it is wonderful and it is a joy and delight to solve except for the people who are yeah yeah who are appearing in the exams yes but for us it was a wonderful journey and sharing this journey with you makes it even more delightful and all of you are requested to like our video share it with your friends comment on it and subscribe to the channel so that you can get more updates on videos like this yes. Thank you, everyone. So this was Nishraga Bhattarajji. And this is Anunna Chatterjee. And we will come back with more lectures. If you want us to, please comment in the comment section and let us know what exactly do you want from us. Yes. And we shall try to deliver. Yes. Like, share and comment. Thank, Thank you. you.